Welcome to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. Ho uh, hope you're having a great day, and thank you for joining us as we continue to celebrate all the wonderful people across this great state who are working so hard to make this such a great place to live, work, and play. Hey, listen, uh, our, my friend, the charter boat captain from Fisherman God Service is going to be joining me shortly, Ronnie Daniels. But before we go to Ronnie, I just want to bring Kyle in for just a second. Kyle and I haven't visited for a while. You hear his voice from time to time because I'll uh, I'll get him to clear something up because he pays close attention to stuff. But um, how you doing, my friend? Not too bad. How about yourself? I'm doing good, man. We've been rolling, that's for sure. Um, you know, we've had some great conversations recently. I look back at my conversation with uh, Wildlife Mississippi's James Cummings and you know, Michael Watson, the conversation we had last week uh, with Michael Watson and then Shad White, um, Paige Roberts. I love the way she described the network here on the coast. And this could apply to the whole state of Mississippi, the the, the Mayberry Network. That was that's a pretty smart description, wasn't it? Is that a new spin on the good old boy network? <laughs> hey, that's that a, different? that's a new yeah, that's a new spin on it's a small world. <laughs> For people who forget that. They do so at their own demise. Isn't that true? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> so listen, Kyle, I have to tell people about something that happened to you the other day. <laughs> you know, first of all, you are, you, you know, you do the music in Superdome during Saints games. You, you're, you, you do local stuff in a big way. Uh, you do the Shuckers games. You do all kinds of, of work at the Mississippi Coast Coliseum. And you do, you'll even do, you know, high school baseball games and other stuff. You're just a guy. You're a professional guy who knows how to rile the crowd up for a game and people seek seek your advice and counsel. But you almost got thrown out, didn't you? <laughs> I did. <laughs> what happened? Um. Well, I I really don't know if it was just if it was me or if it was that particular person was having a bad night. Um, I, I don't think it was me. I don't think it's anything I did any more than I've done before in the past. Umpire just felt that it was too loud and he kind of took, I actually, do you want to see the video? <laughs> Cause I have it. <laughs> do you have the video? I do. I do. Yeah. Here. Well, can, it, will be, will the radio audience be able to hear what, what's going on? Yes. Yeah. Well, good. Let's, let's play it. I, I didn't know you had that. That's awesome. Let's hear it. It's just funny. He, I, I did turn it down, and the reason it took a second for me to turn it down because I was away from the console. It's we're coming <laughs> in the top of the ninth inning, and you know high school baseball only goes seven. So yeah, we're yeah. playing the number one team in the district, tied three apiece, top of the ninth. My son's pitching, trying to keep him into it. He knows Van Halen, and. <laughs> I did turn it down and then even he still was telling me to turn it down more after I turned it down and he was just flat mad. He, you know, well, hey, let's let's explain this. Okay, so what people may not have been able to hear exactly all that went on. So the music's playing, the umpire tells you to turn it down. It took a minute or so, it took a few seconds to turn it down. But the way it works is for people who don't go to baseball games and we're seeing loud music, even at, at little, little kids games these right. days. You know, and they'll play the they'll play whatever song that kid who's up to bat wants to hear, and it's you know it's that kind of stuff. But here's the thing: the way it usually works is when the batter steps into the batter's box, is when the music's supposed to stop. And in this case, the batter hadn't stepped into the batter's box, right? Batter hadn't even reached the halo. He just stepped into the halo from the first base side. He's a right-handed batter, so he had to walk around to the third base side. And I had a conversation with this umpire before the game. Cause he actually walked up to the press box and told me to keep it down. He's already had two people fired one in open Springs and one, I forgot where else. And he didn't want me to be the third. So I'm like, well, I, you know, I've been doing this all my life. I'm never had that as a problem. You shouldn't have it a problem tonight. And I never, the volume never got 
any louder than it was, and it really wasn't even loud if you ask any of the other parents because they all thought it was just as funny as I did. And <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, top of the ninth, it was getting late. I guess he was I, I, he was ready to get ball going. And again, I told him specifically, I said, I typically do not stop the music until the batter puts his first foot in the batter's box. As soon as he does that, I'm out. And that's what I was going to do. That's why I'd stepped away for a second to throw away something in the trash or I was coming back from the bathroom. I don't remember which, but yeah, <laughs> he took, he, he, he did that. And, um, the word got back to, uh, you know, the, the administration of the schools got is, is kind of mad at him too. So, and then yeah. <laughs> a friend that works over at ocean Springs and he goes, yeah, we had that problem with him last week and we thought it was just our guy. But then the following day they had a meeting with, uh, different athletic directors, <laughs> and apparently they've all had problems with the same umpire. So, well, look at the end of the day, you know, at the end of the day, that's that's not called for. There there are rules around how you do this, just like there's rules around decibel levels at the Superdome. I mean, exactly. you know how to play by the rules. And I, you know, that's the last thing I want to do is to be part of the game. I I don't want to be part of the game. I'm just as fine walking into that school or going to do a football game or a baseball game and the principal, Dr. Weaver to just say, Hey, that's the only conversation I want to have with any administration is, Hey, how you doing? That's it. I don't, if they don't know my name, I'm perfectly fine with that because that means I haven't done anything to make anybody mad. <laughs> so, you know, that's just my mind. Well, <laughs> well, people, people know your reputation. They know what you do for a living <clears throat> and you're a consummate professional, but I, I just think it's kind of funny that you got almost kicked out of a high yeah, school baseball game. I do game. too. I could see it if it was maybe the first inning or in the first couple of innings. But when you're in a district game like this and everything's on the line, it's tied at three, top of the ninth. You, hey, come on, you you, <laughs> you don't take you don't pick that particular moment to be the end all be all authority and especially when it's not bothering the, it's not hindering the game. I didn't slow the game down. It, to me, it was uncalled for, but it's yeah, his, so that's, yeah. A, that's unfortunate, man. But I just wanted people to hear. It's kind of funny. It's, oh, you, yeah, it's uh, funny. <laughs> you're out there working on so many fronts and it would be a high school game that you would, you would get, get some trouble. So thanks for sharing that story, man. You bet. And thanks for, for what you do for us. That's for sure. <clears throat> Let's shift gears. Now we're going to move over to my friend, Ronnie Daniels. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> excuse me. Excuse me. I have, uh, I've, I've been getting over a little congestion thing. Feel great, but it's just in my voice today a little bit. Ronnie is a, uh, as a, has a, a fisher, uh, a fisherman. He's a charter boat captain for a company <laughs> called the Fisherman guide service. He's regular on this show and someone I enjoy visiting with Ronnie. How you doing? My friend, man, I'm doing good. Learn today that I'm not sitting next to Kyle at any baseball games. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you chuckling while, while he was telling this story, but I think that's funny. I mean, here's a guy who works with the Saints and the NFL on music in the Superdome, and he's going to get called out at a high school baseball game. It's just so funny to me that that's the case. You know, we're right in, right in the heat of baseball season in our family, too. We spend a lot of time at ballparks, and <laughs> some of the behavior you see there is uh, you just kind of have to have to sit back and chuckle at it every now and then. Hey, listen, man, I coached soccer for all three of my kids. I, I coached baseball. I coached uh, softball with my daughter. I mean, I've I've done it all. And, um, yeah, I've seen it all. It seems like it's even more intense today though. I don't, I don't know why that is, but it, it does seem more intense today back than back when I did it. You know, I think that, and, and I've coached for years and I'm currently coaching a, a 12 year old team, but you know, I think the parents are much more involved in the day to day of baseball now than they were whenever I was growing up. And, you know, we laugh about it around the field. Uh, I'm very good friends with our league president, but you know, <laughs> it's always the T-ball parents. They get fired up, man. They're, <laughs> they're more passionate than any other parent out there. Yeah. My, my son-in-law Keith Williams is, um, is coaching. He's also involved in the league from my grandson, Brody It's coach pitch. You're doing coach pitch now. And, um, 
For, you know, I mean, I'm surprised at how good some of the players are already. You know, it just even at that young age, they're really engaged, lots of practicing, and they're doing hitting. You know, they're they're really developing. I don't remember doing that like that when I was coaching. I mean, we had practice. Don't get me wrong, but it's um, there's a lot more sophistication around it today than there used to be. So it's just pretty intense. Yeah, it is. And there's a lot more opportunity for the kids to learn nowadays. Whenever I was growing up, you know, you might get a chance to go to like a hitting clinic once a year or a fielding clinic, you know, something like that. But uh, there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of really good coaching programs, a lot of more facilities. I mean, we had a batting cage whenever I was growing up, but there's a lot nowadays. You're right, man. They, they, they are the, the batting instruction and all the other stuff that they're doing is really incredible. And that, that's a, that's a testament to the various cities along coast of Mississippi. that really help support these leagues. When we come back on the other side, we'll continue our conversation with Ronnie Daniels. We'll see what's going on in his life these days. We'll see you after this. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews show. I have my friend, Ronnie Daniel, he's somebody I really enjoy talking about the fishing scene. But, you know, he, I, I, when I think about you, Ronnie, I think about not just the fact that you enjoy giving your clients a great experience, but you're, you're almost like incredibly aware of the economic benefits that you bring. And you, you always want to contribute in ways that are beyond just fishing. And we'll come, we'll come to that in just a second. But I, I came across this quote the other day. I have a digital history book that I talk about on this show all the time. I, I read like a wild man. You can't be a former publisher and not do that. And this digital history book is good for me because it gives me a chance to think about important events this time and you know this date in history. And all kinds of interesting things get shared. But but in, in one of the one of the items was a quote from the director Quentin uh, Tarantino, who had, was born back in 1963. And the quote was this, when people ask me if I went to film school, I tell them, no, I went to films. What's interesting about that, and I think about you, to be good at what you do, it's not, you don't go to school on this, man. You just got to go do it. You got to go do it and trial by fire, whether it's how you, how you deal with customers, whether it's about how you build a charter boat business and use technologies to do that, whether it's about fishing itself and learning how to do this in the right way that you can give the best experience. But with, with what you do, you cannot fake it. You have got to just go do it. And that's what I thought about when I said that. No, I went to films. And he's just saying, no, he, he, he learned through the school of hard knocks. And that's the way you, that's the way you do it in the charter boat business, isn't it? You know, inaction is the killer of all great ideas. You know, I, I've always thought that if, if you're going to do something, you got to be ready to do it. Cause if you, you know, you can talk about it forever, but nothing's ever going to happen. Um, <clears throat> you know, whenever I started my charter business, I had no idea what the future was going to hold for me. And, I remember that first year I set a goal that I thought was unattainable of a hundred trips. I said, like, there's no way I'll do that in one year in my first year. Well, I finished with 142 that year and we've seen growth every year since then. And, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things that the charter captains talk about around our dock is charge what you're worth and give the people what they pay for, you know, and, I can, that's one thing I can say about the group of captains that we have out of past Christian. They're going to give it 110% every single day. A lot of people don't realize the stress that's actually involved with being a charter boat captain. They say, man, it's great. All you have to do is go fish every day. But what they don't think about is if I have a bad day at work, I just ruined a kid's birthday, somebody's anniversary a family trip that a family's been saving for all year. You know, there's, there's a lot of pressure to those first few fish making in the boat. It, 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 it really is, man. It really is. Just in general, how are things going these days? Man, we're, uh, it's, it's looking good. Bookings are looking good for the upcoming year. Calendars are starting to fill up, you know, next two or three months, I'm already 60, 70, 80% booked. Um, you know, we've had some rain here recently, but I think we're going to have good water this year. Um, very encouraged to see the moves that Louisiana made with their limits. I think that's going to be purely beneficial 
for everybody in this region, especially uh, in the years to come. You know, a lot of things to look forward to. Yeah, listen, I talked to Sonny about this the other day, and <clears throat> and as as I watched the Mississippi Sound Coalition effort as it relates to the Bonnie Carey and the court filings and rulings that they've gotten, really, really uncovering actually that there may be some other things they could do for up the river even that mm-hmm. could help relieve some of the pressure <clears throat> on the Mississippi Sound. But I'm really pleased with the work that they're doing. In fact, they did a big presentation a few weeks ago for the Gulf Coast Business Council. And um, I, I'm, I continue to be pleased with how important entities along the coast of Mississippi are aligned around that effort. <clears throat> but the point that Sonny and I were talking about is something you and I chatted about before as well, that you know, the Mississippi Sound generally is very resilient, <clears throat> but you can't continue to pour fresh, polluted water into the Mississippi Sound continuously and expect everything to be okay. And for people who don't remember, when we did that two times in one year, opening up the Bonnie Carey Spillway, that ultimately led to an algae bloom. It was just a terrible situation from a fishing point of view, from a tourism point of view, and so on. But what we've seen here, not only have we not had a situation that has required us to open the Bonnie Carey Spillway, but we've also had a little bit of relief. We had a, you know, a dry, listen, a dry time from a rain point of view is terrible for farmers. There's a lot of bad that comes with that. But the reality is that actually has given the water, especially the, the salt water, a chance to kind of recover and, and kind of rebuild itself. You've seen salt water moving up into the the, bay, the bays and bayous, um, fishing in the places that we fish in the Biloxi Bay area has been really, really good. You're starting to see bait fish start to come back. Mm-hmm. We're seeing mullet where we haven't seen mullet in a long, long, long time. I could just keep going on and on about this. And, and Sonny was saying, man, if that were to continue, it means we're going to have a really good year this year. It's It's amazing how resilient it is, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, but I think you're 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 absolutely right. You know, <clears throat> our estuary will bounce back from a lot of different types of disasters. But if you just keep hitting it on the head, like happened for a little while there, it's hard. You know, I mean, ninety eight percent of the oysters in Mississippi Sound were killed in twenty nineteen, and you know that's that's your baseline. That's what's going to clean the water. That's the oyster reefs provide a place for the benthics and the the small forage to grow up and to hide. And, you know, the, the larger fish feed over that. I mean, it's it's all pieces of a puzzle, and, and you can't have one of them missing and, and complete. We're so lucky to have uh, Moby Solange and the Marine Mammal Institute here in coastal Mississippi because, you know, the way he talks about the canary and the landmine <laughs> – the porpoises, porpoises don't know to get out of that that brackish and freshwater scenario, and eventually it just succumbs them. And the, the I mean, we just it was devastating. It was devastating what happened. Moby and his team are incredible. I love all them over there. And you know, the point that they don't know to get out of there. That was one of the most surprising things that I learned during that whole process and and everything and you know i I would have thought well hey they'll they'll just swim out and you know they can cover a lot of ground but they're territorial they're they're gonna stay right there even even if it means dying um that was very surprising to me they uh, tend to go where the bait is so you know it's interesting again we'll find porpoises back in back bay on a pretty regular occasion these days. I mean, you know, they, they're, they're all over the place. It's just, to me, it's fascinating to be fishing near the Pops Ferry Road Bridge, for example, and see porpoises. I just, you know, yeah. they, they're, 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 they, they go to where they're going to find food. And I, I guess they're curious in that way, but, but yeah, we, we've had, we've had a lot of luck as it relates to weather and hurricanes and the Bonnie Carey spillway. There's this one beast of a problem that's hanging out there on the horizon. Unfortunately, is that, that, that Breton sound diversion project. Mm-hmm. And how much do you think about that and worry about that? Uh, it's been in my thoughts a lot. Um, especially once USM came out with their report and, you know, they projected a hundred plus additional days of, 
I think it was less than five parts salinity in the Mississippi Sound. You know, a lot of people think, hey, that's way down the river. It's not going to affect us up here. But according to the science that has come out about it, it, it absolutely will. Um, you know, and not only us, I, I you know, I, I fear for the, for the commercial fishermen between here and there, you know, the Louisiana guys that are all down through there, Delacro, 20 years ago, that's where everybody wanted to go. And, you know, I spent a lot of time down there with a lot of friends, have a lot of good memories down there. Uh, but I'm afraid you're going to see a lot of the saltwater side of that just completely wiped out if, if that ends up happening. Yeah, the one good thing, you know, that's been one of the good things about the whole discussion around the Bonacary Spillway. People tend to think that it's just a Mississippi Sound issue and that, they're, you know, the federal government's just kind of dumping all that on us. But the reality is that where, if you think about where the Bonacary Spillway is, which is on the western side of Lake Pontchartrain, so it dumps all that that into Lake Pontchartrain. Think about all the charter boat captains and fishermen that enjoy Lake Pontchartrain, and then of course it it then flows into Lake Bourne, and then into the Louisiana Marsh, and it kind of works its way into the Mississippi Sound, and. And, and boy, did it in a big way that year. But, you know, it's an interest is everyone on, on the eastern side of the uh, yes, on the eastern side of the river in Louisiana, they're, they're with us. So this is not just about Mississippi. What I think is important, though, is that before they didn't have to consider the impact on the Mississippi Sound when they did anything that they did. And now they're had, they have to have discussions about it. And and I, yes. I congratulate the Mississippi Sound Coalition for, for uh, you know, getting those rulings in their favor. Long hill to climb yet, but at least we're having a broader conversation about it. When we come back on the other side, we'll continue our conversation with Charter Boat Captain Ronnie Daniels. We'll see you after this. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show. I have my friend Captain Ronnie Daniels with us today. He's the fisherman guide service. He uh, fishes out of Pasco Shean. And this like really incredible thing that they've uh, developed there with the the charter docks. And if you haven't been over to Pasco Shannon in a while, you ought to drive over there and see how they've set up their situation for charter boat captains. It's really, really incredible. Um, Ronnie was a, a big part of that in Rimmer Covington and others. It's just a, a great story. Hey, before we shift gears, though, and come back to fishing and whatever else might be on your mind, um, I, I, I wanted to make sure I didn't, I didn't leave anything unsaid <clears throat> or you didn't leave anything unsaid as it relates to what we experienced as it relates to the Bonnie Carey spillway was another point that you wanted to make. Well, you know, one of the, you, you made a great point in saying that the impacts, you know, we weren't really considered in, in the impacts of that, but it, it wasn't just us either during while that was going on. I know pretty much every charter boat captain was looking at the same thing, and that was satellite images, trying to figure out how far reaching that water was. And it didn't stop just with Mississippi. I mean, that, that water pushed all the way over Dolphin Island, Mobile Bay, and, you know, encroached into Alabama as well. I mean, that was a monster in 2019. Yeah, it really was, man. It was definitely a monster. I remember being offshore during that time. And, of course, you get far, far enough offshore. This is always a little bit true for people who are not aware of this, that when you've got the wind blowing in a certain direction and you and it depends on whether the, the river is high, this is the Mississippi River, then what will happen is the muddy water will kind of move into some of the areas. I mean, I was talking about really muddy water. We'll move mm -hmm. into some of the areas that we like to fish. I remember actually one year we were diving. We were in about, uh, about 90 feet of water. You know, I would say about 50 miles offshore. And the water was just absolutely brown, completely brown. So we said, okay, let's go ahead and check it out, and we'll see what we got. So essentially what it was, though, about 10 feet. We went through 10 feet of this layer of just really brown, really nasty water. And then we emerged in the most beautiful, clear water you've ever seen in your life. It is truly incredible. Um so when you further out you get, the fresh water stays up high, the salinity stays down low. But when you're in shallow water, you don't have that benefit, do you, Ronnie? No, you don't. That, you know, that's what I was about to say. Out there in the deep water, you have that. You know, one of the things that I've seen in the time that I've spent fishing out of Venice is you would have that really dirty water, Coast Guard cut that was down in the South Pass. One of the things I'm thinking about 
we run through there and it's just chocolate milk where you're running. But if you look behind the boat in your prop wash, you'd see this just beautiful clean water where the brown separated. But the problem here is you've got ultra salt down there right at the mouth of the river. You know, it's pure salt right outside of there. So that that provided a, a really good layer of separation for that, that fresh water, muddy water to stay on top of. Whereas here, we're not as salty. We're a little more brackish. And, you know, Moby, Moby explains it all the time with, with our sound and, and Lake Bourne, you know, we're basically a cul-de-sac. Everything just kind of backs up in here and mixes together. You know, so mm -mm. we don't we don't really get that separation as much. Yeah, it's uh, the way I, I remember I was on the Gulf of Mexico program, Citizens Advisory Committee, many, many, many years ago. But it was at the time it was uh, multiple states that bordered the Gulf of Mexico and Mexico as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned a lot about about the Gulf of Mexico. You know, I mean, you know, G Gulf of Mexico is sort of like what you're talking about as well on a different on a different level. But then we we had a lot of focus as well during that program on the Mississippi Sound, the semi enclosed uh, estuary and complex, a true estuary and complex where mm -hmm. it's surrounded by these wetlands and barrier islands and all that. Now, look, some people you know will visit here and say, well, the water's brown and the water's not as deep and blah, blah, blah. But the, but the reality of that estuary and complex that we some may not fully appreciate or understand, it is an absolutely amazing estuary for raising shrimp and fish and and having a great economic life. I mean, it's it, we go back, we go back forever in, in coastal Mississippi's history, and it has provided the livings for a lot of people. It's a very special uh, Mississippi Sound is a very special place, isn't it? Oh, it's absolutely the basis for why we're a world-renowned fishery right here. You know, we go hand in hand with that southeast Louisiana area, the the Biloxi Marsh, and that's so confusing to people. <laughs> it's, Who's on first? What's on second? I tell people we're going to the Biloxi Marsh. Well, that's in Mississippi. Now we're going to Louisiana, but you said we were going to Biloxi. <laughs> it gets so <laughs> confusing for them. But you know, all of this ties in together, and we grow some really good fish here. We grow a lot of them, um, and we provide a lot of opportunities for people to really enjoy the outdoors. Now, yeah, you're right. We don't have that emerald water like Destin does, but our fish sure like growing up where in the water that we have. Hey, what's interesting though, this is one of the points that Sonny was making is that he has seen, because we haven't had the big rains and the big influx of fresh water and so on, he's seen the water around Cat Island, for example, as crystal clear and as beautiful as you would ever expect to see in a place like Key West. Now, again, very different situation. Key West doesn't have the muddy water and the muddy bottom and the salt. You know, it's a whole different situation. But when people think of Cat Island, they don't necessarily think about could it could it actually get that clear? And the answer is yes, it can actually get that clear, can it, Ronnie? You know, it's funny you bring that up. My new boat that I just got, um, the front of the front live well looks like an aquarium. It's got a it's got a glass plate in there, so you can see into the live well. And we were fishing the east side of Cat Island the other day, and it legitimately looked like an aquarium looking in there because that water looked like it came out of my faucet. You know, I mean, it was just as clean and clear as it could be. Um, another thing with all that clean water is is the species that we've seen over the past year. Even the end of last year, we're seeing them now. Whenever you get that real good clean salt pushing in, you start seeing fish like, Pompano, uh, mangrove snappers showing up in places that we wouldn't normally see them in a year-to-year -year thing. Towards the end of the year last year, I was in the middle of Lake Bourne, and, and we caught a couple mangrove snapper in there trout fishing. Yeah. And you just don't see that all the time. And Pompano showing up in the west end of the Black Sea Marsh last fall. You know, I mean, that, I've never seen that. I've never caught a Pompano. Hey, listen, we made a run to the... Uh, to the um, um, horseshoe lumps mm -hmm. about three weeks ago. <clears throat> we had some decent reports of yellowfin. Mm -hmm. So we ran out there, and it was a great day. We had a, we had a terrific day. But, man, we couldn't get a bite. I think we got, may have gotten one, but, you know, we didn't, we didn't ha keep it on. And um, we ended up moving, and we ended up actually trolling 
trolling up some rigs actually north of there, north of, of the lumps, and we missed an absolute giant wahoo. But okay. so you know, it's one of those days. I mean, just we, you know, you February's February, you got to hit it right, or it can be a yeah. long day. But we the yeah. weather the weather worked for us, and we had a really good day. But when we got back though, the next day we learned that all the elephant were caught up in shallow water. I mean, they weren't anywhere. They, 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 it was more 20, 30 miles uh, north of where we were. I don't remember hearing that before. I mean, we went through some schools of fish and maybe, a, a, I'm saying bait fish, and maybe 100 feet of water. But, it's, you know, that actually, what we saw might have actually been yellowfin. It never even occurred to us that that might be the case. So, you know, it's so interesting to see from one year to the next, how different it might be. You know, you just got to, you just got to pay attention. And good thing about social media, if you, if you pay close attention, you'll, you'll get some good, you'll, you'll get some good reports and all of that. You bring that up and, you know, it made me think about something I saw the other day. I'm sure you've been seeing this. What about the great white shark that swam all the way up in besides chandelier? You know, I immediately sent a text to my buddies and said, I've got this great visual of what y'all would look like if we were waist deep at Freemason pulling in trout and this 1,400-pound shark comes up trying to eat one of the trout. You know, that that would absolutely be a high-stepping moment. Isn't that amazing, though? What you know, the fact that we we can track these things that come from way up the East Coast and into the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, and then you know they're seeing more sightings off Alabama and Florida. But you know, it's it's fascinating what research is giving us, you know, because they can tag these things and track them the way they are. Um, you know, maybe they've done this before, but ne now we know they do it. Well, and it's it's publicized. You know, we get to see some of it, and you know, to think that that fish was caught way up the east coast, whatever it was, North Carolina, I think. Yeah, and, what was it a two month time period, twenty seven hundred miles, something like that. It was cruising the beaches down around Mexico, Texas, and swung in the chandelier for a day or two. That, that's amazing to get to see all of that. That may have been what pushed all your tuna in too. Yeah, I, I was just <laughs> so interesting, so interesting. Great whites, man. That's you know, of course. I think Jaws still gets people's attention and what that movie brought to the discussion around around sharks. Hey, when we come back on the other side, we'll continue our conversation with Captain Ronnie Daniels. We'll see you after this. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show. One of the reasons I love doing this show, incidentally, from the Citizens Bank Studios, I get to become friends with people like Ronnie Daniels. He's a such a committed charter boat captain. I, I met Ronnie one day. I, w I remember when I was young, just the smell of diesel fuel made me think about a, a charter boat, you know? And it was a time in my life I thought, that's all I really want to do. I think I'll just be a charter boat captain someday. But uh, I've always had a deep respect for you guys. And as I've gotten older, I appreciate that it's a business and it's it can be rough. You know, so I watch you, I, you know, follow you on social media. Not every day is a beautiful sunrise or a beautiful sunset, man. There's a, it's hard work, isn't it, my friend? It is, you know. I have guys ask me sometimes, man, you ever get tired of fishing? I tell them I'm tired of it right now. <laughs> but I love it. I wouldn't trade my job for anything. It gives us a lot of opportunities. One of my favorite things about it are the people that we get to meet, you know, and, and giving them experiences that, that I grew up doing here. And, you know, we get people from all over, honestly, all over the world. I've had several different countries on my boat, you know. Yeah, that's so that's so awesome. Anything else you want to say about the charter service before we shift gears? I got a, I got something else I want to ask you about. Man, if people are looking to fish, they need to go ahead and get in touch with us now. We got some of the best months out of the year coming up, and if you wait till the last minute to call, you you may be left standing on the dock. So go ahead and get the <laughs> dates booked now. That's the Fisherman God Service, and that's uh, Captain Ronnie Daniels. Hey, listen, um, you and I chat a little bit about the outdoor show that I have. The feedback that I'm getting from across the state has been incredible. I looked at, looked at the uh, Facebook page this morning and 21,000 people engaged in the conversations and in the show, you know, thousands of, uh, thousands of minutes of, 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 uh, of views. I, I believe radio is King. I mean, radio is definitely King, but it's great to have sort of a social media presence as well. 
and uh, and then of course the, the podcast platform as well. One of the things we've been talking about on the show has been that CWD, chronic wasting disease, and that's a, a, a complete it will it is a fatal disease 100% of the time for white-tailed deer. Is now uh, the 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 incident of positive tests in Mississippi continues to increase, and something we really got to take very seriously. It unfolds over decades instead of months, so it's, it makes it hard to manage. Um, I was just curious, you know, you're you like to deer hunt, I, and in the world that you're in, um, you know, do, are you concerned about chronic wasting disease? You know, Ricky. Uh, I, Certainly not nearly as educated on it as you, probably not as educated as I should be, but it hasn't really affected any of the areas that I hunt. Um, yeah, absolutely worried about it. I mean, I would hate to see, we've got, we've got great deer hunting in Mississippi and, you know, I would hate to see something like that deteriorate that or take away from that because you know we've come a long ways since i first started hunting as to where we are with our deer population and, and growing deer here in mississippi hey the way that i talk about it is that the goal since there's no since we've got to wait for science to catch up you know there's a lot of science that there's a lot of sharing of data across the united states now that is really helping us understand best practices and things like that as it relates to how to manage it but we have to slow the prevalence down. We have to put best practices in place that slow it down to give the science a chance to, to catch up. One of the things we've been talking about on my show, in fact, is uh, it's legal in Mississippi to, to uh, use feeders for, for deer. And uh, so that we've been having a conversation. Will Primos from Primos Outdoors has joined me and Lake Pickle and others. And there, you know, uh, Robbie Robbie uh, Kroger from from Blood Origin said that could be the anchor that sinks hunting in America. I mean, it's, that, it's really that serious, actually. So um, we've been talking about feeding, and you know, I have some feeding that we do at some of the farms that I'm involved in. Uh, I don't personally like to be around feeders. You know, my biggest deer in my life came this year, had no no involvement with a feeder whatsoever. But when you're on a property line and somebody on the other side is using a feeder. It, it's a dilemma. I think every every hunter in Mississippi is involved in that dilemma. Do y'all face the same kind of dilemmas? Well, you know, it, that's what I told you earlier. I've heard a lot of that sentiment. You know, I don't have a choice but to do it because all my neighbors are. And, and I'm lucky enough to have a couple different properties that we hunt. One of them is right on the Mississippi River. I think we have one feeder on like 6,500 acres, and we put that out just to be able to shoot pigs. Um now, the other properties that I've hunted, yeah, you know, they're small tracks. They're four or five, 600 acres, and everybody around you is feeding. So you've got to put it out. You know, my kids have killed deer over them. I, like you, had the opportunity to kill the biggest deer in my life this past year, and that deer was coming out of the woods into a clearing. You know, he wasn't eating anything but acorns and grass. Yeah, that's so that's so interesting. I have, uh, you know, I've had, there's been a lot of focus on – uh, on the commission recently, and one one commissioner in particular, Leonard Bentz, has been a bit on a tear uh, about me because he's he doesn't like the fact over the last couple of years I've really focused on some of the decisions they're making and the role that he's been playing in some of those decisions. And uh, he he actually attacked me, saying I had no credibility because he went he dove into my personal Facebook page and found pictures of feeders as if that there was something wrong with that. So I never said I didn't use feeders. The reality is I think the state is in a position now where they have to have a serious conversation about whether supplemental feeding should continue or not because it's proven now that supplemental feeding bring deer together to enable them to spread the disease. And one of the interesting studies that Mississippi State did is that they actually just checked the feeder itself. And the prion, this, this myoform protein that causes CWD, was actually found on the feeder itself. So it's interesting to think of feeders as a super spreader event. So I think our state faces a moment in time where they've really got to think about this. And um, they've been managing it, but they haven't been as aggressive as they need to. The scientists are, are getting aligned around how to deal with it now. And, you know, there's some special interests that are pushing back. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's getting complicated, unfortunately. But, um, but I think that the majority of the commissioners eventually will make the right decision. It concerns me greatly. The more I learn, the more I, I'm concerned about it. And, uh, I know, you know, congratulations, incidentally, on having a, a really good uh, time of a, a good, good season this year. 
Well, I appreciate it. I always have a good time talking with you, Ricky. I look forward to the next next time we get to do it. Okay, this is in Captain Ronnie Daniels. Listen, have a great day, and we will see you tomorrow.